Good morning. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this beautiful Sunday, this third day of April, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Uh, what a joy it is to be here in the house of the Lord. Those of you who are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary at First United Methodist Church in North Wilkesboro, those of you who are worshiping with us via our live stream on YouTube or Facebook, uh, whether in real time or uh, through the archived version of this service, however it is that you are joining us, uh, we, uh, we welcome you and we give God thanks uh, for your presence here uh, in this worshiping community of uh, faith. If you're here in the sanctuary, if you would find and sign a uh, pew pad, uh, which is, uh, there are several in each pew, and tear out the page uh, that is uh, for today and just leave it uh, uh, on the seat. Uh, there uh, uh, at the end of the pew closest to the aisle, and we'll get those uh, later. And if there's any of your contact information has changed, that's a great way uh, to let us know. Those of you um, uh, worshiping with us uh, virtually, if your contact information has changed, you can always let Molly know, or if you have a login with our new uh, ACS Realm uh, system, you can make some of those changes your, um, yourself. Uh, you might also, uh, so uh, uh, thank you for that. And if you have any questions about getting connected with our Realm system, which allows you to do a number of things, including to see a record of your giving and um, all that, you can let Molly Nichols know and she'll get you um, connected. Uh, we have various ways to give through the Connect app, through our uh, online giving, our secure online giving, through the offering plates here at the front and back of the sanctuary, through our post office box, dropping something off for Marie during the week, however it is that you give uh, and support the ministries of this church, uh, thank you. Uh, we are wrapping up and we'll send in this week our offering for UMCOR's work in Ukraine and the surrounding uh, regions. And so uh, we did have some gifts still come in this week. And if you're here with us this morning, you can still... Uh, uh, slip a gift into the offering plate, and then we'll get those wrapped up and sent in uh, this week. Thank you to everyone who supported uh, this uh, offering, and we'll let you know the results of it once we get everything um, totaled. You can give those gifts to the church. You can even do that through our online system, uh, just uh, uh, through our missions giving. Just mark your gift, UMCOR Ukraine, and Marie will get that in the right, um, in the right line. Uh, we uh, return in our service of worship this morning here in the sanctuary. Our uh, uh, exchange of the peace uh, returns as we slowly move back to normal. We still uh, have folks who are uh, uh, making all sorts of choices in terms of uh, COVID and soon will be a flu season, all those things. And so we'll leave that up to you uh, as we've all gotten fairly adept at kind of negotiating one another's um, spaces. But I thought that was a, a, another thing that we could do. And it's um, as we share God's peace with, uh, with one another here in this time of worship. Um, our Lenten study is on chapter 5, and we'll meet this afternoon at 3.30, and then our final meeting will be next Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock to make time to go uh, to the uh, sunrise celebration and Easter egg hunt at 5 o'clock. And we do have uh, a chance for folks to pre-register for that, so Lauren can do a little better uh, planning. And so our Easter weekend schedule is in the bulletin. It's also in the grapevine. And so we hope you're marking your calendars and making plans for these special occasions um, ahead. We're grateful for our uh, strong uh, UMIF program and our Wacky Wednesday program. They continue to meet. And uh, so um, if you know of a high schooler or a middle schooler or a student in K through 5, uh, send them our way. Uh, UMIF and Wacky Wednesday are wonderful programs, and we're so grateful um, to the staff and also to the volunteers who help make those programs um, possible. We want to extend our uh, deepest uh, sympathies uh, to uh, Heath and Heather uh, Johnson and family on the March 28th death of um, Heath Johnston. Our um, prayer list is in our uh, bulletin, I mean, is in our grapevine uh, but we've been asked to lift a prayer for Jimmy Lasecki, for Ann Smith, Barbara Minton, Susan Gardner, for Mary McSwain and Tom McIntosh, 
for Mark Pearson and Sylvia Prevett, for Marty Ellison and George and Ruth Reeves, for Jennifer Skaggs and Kevin Glaze and Drew Church and Linda Absher, um, for the Preschool Steering Committee, for Jim Dixon and Jack Neal, for Joe DeJournette and Raymond Weda, for the country and the people of Ukraine, for Stephen Balkum and Kathy Colbo, for the family of Jean McNeil, the family of Vida Pearson, the family of Sarah Hunter Sears, for the family of Walter McSwain, the family of Heath Johnson, the family of Cameron Johnson, and for Jerry and Linda Spears. If you have a prayer request you'd like to share just with me, you can let me know with our intercessory prayer team that's led by Teresa Minton, and you can let Teresa and I know if you have one to share with the public list um, for our prayers. We engender the prayers of this um, community. So all that said, uh, as the sun streams into this beautiful place, wherever you are with us uh, here in person or virtually, I encourage you to um, settle for a moment. Let some of the busyness we all carry around with us uh, fall away as we turn to God in worship. Fill your lungs with the breath of this new day. Find a connection with the earth God made somewhere, wherever it is beneath your feet. For this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. It is a sad day to be a Duke fan this morning, but it is a beautiful day in the Tar Heel State, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Will you join me with a call to worship printed in your bulletin? I'll read the part in, not in bold, and you'll read the part in bold. O Lord, come to our assistance. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Will you join me in the opening prayer? 
O Lord, our God, teach us temperance and self-control that we may live in the Spirit and be mindful of all that Jesus endured and sacrificed for our sakes and how he was made perfect through sufferings. Help us so to keep the fast that you have chosen, that we may loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free. Through the grace of Christ Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. One of my favorite parts of, the, of worship service is the um, passing God's peace with one another, so I encourage you to do that in just a moment, and then make sure you're back and ready to sing the hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. The peace of Christ be with you. As God's grateful children.
Thank you. you. may be seated. If you'll keep your hymnal out and turn to page 847, we'll read the first lesson, Psalm 126. We'll read responsively, which means you read the part in bold. And whether the letter R is, we'll say together response to. And we need to put a a comma between the word night, is that right? And the word weeping. Pastor Jim reminded me of that. Psalm 126, let's begin with response two. For the night, weeping may tarry, With the morning, light comes joy. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. For the night, weeping may tarry. With the morning, light comes joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. For the night, weeping may tarry. With the morning, light comes joy. And all God's people said, Amen. Any children, there we go, I invite any children to come down if you would like to join us this morning. All right, so what are some things that are valuable? Do you know what it means for something to have value? It might be a big word for y'all. Value. Do you know what that means? Well, usually we use this word when we're talking about something that's worth a lot, maybe a lot of money. So let's say you get a brand new car, a really nice car that costs a lot of money. Some people would call that a valuable item. But I brought something special with me that has a lot of value to me, even though if I were to go buy this at the store, it'd probably be maybe $5, maybe that. I don't know. It's pretty thin. But this box is valuable to me because it means a lot to me, even if it's not worth a lot of money. And this was used in my wedding. Our ring bearer, the the boy, yeah, there's another one. The boy who carried my nephew, who carried the rings down, kind of, used this box. (laughs) And then inside of it, I have something special too. And some of you would probably... No, here's a $2 bill. And a $2 bill, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, is really only worth $2. But this is special because this la- a lady that used to come to this church, Miss Betty Link, would cut out newspaper clippings. And anytime I was in the newspaper or other kids were in the newspaper, she would send it to us in a card with a $2 bill. And this $2 bill was from Miss Betty Link. And I've kept it in this box. And then I also have another cool piece of money, and this is from the Bahamas, and it's just worth one dollar. That's not worth a lot, but I went on a mission trip to the Bahamas one time, and I met a lot of really cool kids at an orphanage that I helped at, and I got this dollar bill when I was there, and it's really only worth a dollar, but it means a lot more to me. Same with this two dollar bill. And same with this little box. Someone else might get these, and it might not mean much to them, but it means a lot to me. So there are a lot of things in our lives that we can't really put a price tag on. That means we can't put money to what it's worth to us. 
So have you ever gotten a special gift? What was your special gift? Or were you just waving? Hmm. What was your special gift? What was it? A bear named Fluffy. And do you keep this bear with you a lot? I remember you telling us that last week. You lost Fluffy one time and you found it and it made you feel happy. You probably couldn't buy another Fluffy that's as important as that Fluffy, could you? Your original one. That's a big word. Good job. So here's another question. Oh, what was your special gift? Yeah, your aerial. You keep it with you in bed, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a dinosaur. So we have a fluffy, an aerial, and a dinosaur, and those are really special to you all. Okay, so if you were to give Jesus a present, what do you think you would give him? Your special fluffy. That is very special because it's your special thing. Wow. Hmm. Well, there's a story in the Bible about someone who gave Jesus a very special gift, maybe as special as your fluffy. So Jesus had come to have dinner at the home of Lazarus, and Lazarus was a man who he raised from the dead. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, were there, and Mary did something very special for Jesus. She took some expensive perfume, you know perfume that smells really good? She took expensive perfume and poured it on him. In fact, she put it on his feet, and then she wiped it with her hair. And there are a few things that might sound really weird about this. For one thing, why would perfume cost so much? It was actually worth like a year's worth of work, this perfume was. Well, it was a special oil that was used when someone was buried. And Mary was getting Jesus ready for his death, kind of, in a way. And it may seem odd to us that she did this, but Jesus loved that gift. It was very special. Hold on, let me finish. It was very special that she did that. And you know, Jesus values us too. We are valuable to Jesus. And he loves any gift we bring, whether it's singing or a prayer or time with him, reading the Bible, maybe helping other people could be a gift that you give Jesus. But the biggest gift you could give him is you, to give him yourself. Because Jesus can do amazing things if we let him show us what he wants us to do. If we give him our lives and say, Jesus, you can do whatever you want. I will do it for you. That is the greatest gift we could give him. So Jesus can do amazing things more than anything that money can buy. And Jesus is worth more than anything we could buy. So let's say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. And please help us give you our lives. Amen.
Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of John. We're in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel, the first eight verses. Hear the Gospel. Listen for the good news. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the day table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it and wiped his feet, wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Many Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus. I'm continuing on a few verses. Whom he had raised from the dead. The chief priests decided that they would kill Lazarus too. It was because of Lazarus that many of the Jews had deserted them and come to believe in Jesus. May God bless our reading, our hearing, our living into this holy and precious word. We've jumped today from Luke, where we have been talking about bearing fruit and pondering who gets to negotiate the terms of God's extravagantly welcoming and redeeming love. Last week, uh, I said, uh, fortunately, it's not you, it's not me who gets to decide how expansive and welcoming God's redeeming love is. And we have jumped from Luke to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of, of John. Our prescribed lesson is for the first eight verses I actually read into verse uh, 12. It is such a good story. It's this story about Jesus stopping in at the home of his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus before he heads to Jerusalem for what he knows will be the last time. It had only been a few days, it seems, since he had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, since he had called him out of the tomb wrapped in his funeral bandages and smelling like death. Word had spread about this itinerant rabbi and how he really did seem to be the resurrection and the life. Just look at Lazarus back from the dead. And many in the region, we learn, were convinced that his words were true, which drove the chief priests and the Pharisees mad. They'd called a council and asked themselves, this is near the end of chapter 11, between the raising of Lazarus and where I started reading this morning, they called a council, they asked themselves, what are we going to do? This man is doing many miraculous signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our people. The high priest said, it is better that one man die for the people than the whole nation be destroyed. And from that day on, John says, they plotted to kill him. Jesus and his disciples laid low for a little while, but then the time for the Passover came near and people were heading to Jerusalem to prepare for the big celebration. The chief priests and the Pharisees gave orders 
that if anyone saw Jesus, they should report it so that he could be arrested. Surely he won't show his face. I can hear people saying to one another, no one could be that brave or that dumb. And so it was six days before Passover with everyone on the lookout for him and a a price, it seems, on his head. Jesus and his disciples went to, to, to Bethany, a small community on the Mount of Olives less than two miles from Jerusalem to be with his friends. They throw a dinner party for him out of gratitude, I'm guessing, to celebrate the very act that had been the final straw. Lazarus, who might might by now have scrubbed the stench of death off, who though will always be Lazarus, whom Jesus has raised from the dead, that's a nickname you'd be hard-pressed to lose, I think. Lazarus joins them at the table. I wonder if he, too, had been keeping to himself just to get some peace. Martha, who with her, while her brother Lazarus was still dead in the tomb, had made the ultimate profession of faith. Jesus had said to her, do you know who I am? I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha had replied, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, the one who is coming into the world Jesus comes to their house and Martha is once again busy serving. That surprises no one. But she has, it seems, given up on complaining about her sister Mary, who it seems is back sitting at Jesus' feet. Only this time, Mary is not there to learn from what Jesus says. She has in her hands an alabaster jar of of nard, three quarters of a pound worth nearly 300 days wages, which might take a lifetime to amass. Nard was imported from the Himalayan mountains some 3,000 miles away. The horizontal underground stems, those of us uh, who've taken the Master Gardener class might know those are called the rhizomes of the spikenard plant, were, were dried and used to make a perfumed ointment with an intense and warm and, and musky uh, odor. It was tremendously expensive, used often, most often, to anoint royalty and high priests, and maybe for those who could afford it, the dead. Sealed in an alabaster jar, it could last for years, but once the jar was opened, it would not last long. Maybe Mary had bought it after her brother Lazarus died, knowing how he smelled when he emerged from the tomb. Maybe she did not want to be caught unprepared the next time around. Maybe she believed her friend Jesus would be the next to die. And so she spent everything she had so that at least someone would be ready. And now there was a warrant out for his arrest with rumors of a death sentence swirling around the neighborhood. And so sitting there at Jesus' feet, she decided not to wait. And so she broke the seal on this extravagant ointment and anointed his feet. Mark, you might remember, tells a similar story of an unknown woman who anoints Jesus' head as preparation for his death and burial. But in John's story, it's his friend Mary, and she anoints not his head, but his feet. There's a story of another unknown woman in Luke who anoints Jesus' feet. Mary, his friend, anoints his feet in this act of of love, this act that is uh, lost on us. She, she wipes his feet with her, her hair, pointing us maybe toward uh, the story of Jesus at the Last Supper, that scene where he kneels and wipes his disciples' feet, not with uh, his hair, I think, but with a, a cloth or his uh, robe. He wipes his disciples' feet, kneeling there before them as a sign of his love for them. She kneels before him, breaks open the 
the jar, anoints his feet, and wipes them as a sign of her love for the master. The smell of the nard, three quarters of a pound of it, is overwhelming. It fills the house, John says. Any of you who've opened uh, even a small bottle of a pungent essential oil can imagine how this might be true if you opened a, a large bottle of something so fragrant. In an instance, the fragrance of her brother's death has been replaced with the fragrance of her extravagant love and devotion to the Christ, the Messiah, God's Son. It is a fleeting act of love which we church folks are not that unfamiliar with. A chancel choir labors to learn a new anthem or a cantata and then sings it into the worship service, filling the moment. And then it's gone. There may be a recording of it, but truth be told, that's more like a memory. All that work, all that concentration, all that effort... It gets sung into the moment, and then it disappears. Or a Sunday school teacher prepares a lesson, leads a discussion. The the class is adjourned, leaving only an echo of the questions and the challenges behind. Or a devoted church member surveys her own yard and sometimes the neighbors, and then puts together an arrangement for the altar, giving Glory to God in an act of love that's fleeting, not forever. We church folks are not that unfamiliar with these fleeting acts of devotion to the Lord. If in revealing, in in raising Lazarus from the dead, if in raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus has been revealed as as divine, then Mary in this extravagant act of anointing Jesus with a fleeting touch of love has become our example of a faithful disciple painting for us a portrait of what it is to fully embrace Jesus' death and resurrection. She's become the portrait of a faithful disciple fully embracing Jesus' story and his fate and his journey And she has become the embodiment of his first commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your being and all your mind. So here in this scene at the table we have Lazarus who is supposed to be dead but is alive. And we have Jesus who is alive but is talking like he's already dead. And we have these two devoted sisters, prophets in their own right. And we have Judas. Mary pours out a lifetime of savings and Judas complains. That perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. He said this, John tells us, and what we learned in our literature classes is an aside. The Gospel of John contains uh, between 50 and 100 of these little uh, asides. John says in an aside that Judas complained because, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take what was in it. The other Gospels don't tell us this part of the story, but they do name Judas as the one who took the money from the high priests and as payment for betraying Jesus. From the very beginning, Christians have puzzled over this mystery as to why the author of the world would have among his closest disciples someone he knew would betray him. Maybe it's to imply that if a bad disciple doesn't care about the poor, a good disciple does. That's Jesus' second commandment, which is like the first. You will always have the poor among you. You must love your neighbor as yourself. 
Mary breaks the seal on the alabaster jar. Judas complains. Jesus comes to Mary's defense. Leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. And many Jews, John says, learned he was there. They came not only to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the the chief priest decided that they would kill Lazarus too. It was because of Lazarus that many of many of, of the Jews had deserted them and come to believe in Jesus. The chief priests wanted, it seems, no public reminders of what this impertinent miracle worker had done making Lazarus a a, a prototype for future generations of Christ's followers who will be persecuted for being born again church tradition says that Lazarus was eventually forced to to flee the region and eventually settled on the island of Cyprus where Paul and Barnabas appointed him bishop All I know is that I imagine him spending the rest of his days trying to deserve the gift he had been given. Which is a great project for those of us who consider ourselves recipients like Lazarus, our cousin, of a precious gift from the author of life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. I invite you to turn with me to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, ever active, ever present, in these waning days of Lent, we watch for you more eagerly than a century watches for the morning light. Or at least we want to be the kind of people who watch for you. We are so easily distracted, O Lord. We have heard the stories of how you create and sustain life, even in the most most death-defying circumstances. And yet somehow we refuse to climb up out of the grave of our sinfulness and our self-absorption. We know that you are the source of strength. And yet we prefer to keep our armies and weapons just in case. We have heard what you said about storing up treasures here on earth. And yet we spend much of our time shopping for buying and polishing things that make us feel better about ourselves. And we lose sleep over whether... We're going to have enough to buy the next pile of stuff. We know you said that our willingness to care for those less fortunate would be a sign of our love for you. And yet we still plan our routes to drive around them whenever we can. Forgive us, we pray. Bend down close to us and breathe into us once more the breath of life. Give us courage to accept your gift of new beginnings. Rattle our understanding. Redeem us, transform us. Help us to see beyond the darkness of Calvary to the joy of the empty tomb. Put your disconcerting words of hope 
and songs of joy in our mouths. So that even before we feel ready to share your good news, we might still somehow be deployed for your good purposes. Hear, O God, all the prayers of our hearts, spoken and unspoken, and where our prayers fall short, perfect them. Pour your love into every household and situation on our prayer list. These are our prayers, and we lift them up in the name of Christ who lives, that we might live also, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Abel. This old wooden uh, offering plate, empty and a little worse for wear, it is not empty in God's eyes. It is full of all the gifts of this household of faith, the gifts of time and creativity, of songs and financial resources gifts to the general fund, gifts to the Ukraine offering, gifts to the youth, gifts to the music ministry, all of it in this offering plate, the way God sees it, signs of hope and love and caring. Also, I'm glad it's not actually in this plate or I wouldn't be able to hold it, is a Brand new uh, Hobart dishwasher, which we just ordered this week. Those of you who've worked in the kitchen might know that we have a, a dishwasher. It was actually in the old kitchen, got moved to the new kitchen, has provided years of service, but its time has come. And so the trustees had a special meeting this week and decided to get up off some $11,000 to buy a new dishwasher, not mostly for our sake, we're still cranking back up, but for uh, groups like uh, ADAP and others who might use our kitchen until we're sort of back uh, uh, going with our meals, a sign of hope and um, made possible by the gifts of some of you and the gifts of generations who've come before and planned for days just like uh, today when we needed to continue to care and nurture this treasure box uh, that we've been entrusted with. So dishwashers and Ukraine offerings and general offerings and gifts to the youth and the music fund and all the other ministries of this church, all here in this offering plate, I think the way God sees it. And as over all that, I'd like to offer a prayer of thanks. Gracious God, thank you for the way that you Give us courage and give us faith to give back to you that which is already yours. Bless the, the gifts of this congregation and all who give them. Not for, not for our sake, not for our glory, but for yours. Amen. Amen. If you remain standing and join with me in the affirmation of faith is found on page 887 in the hymnal and remain standing for our closing hymn.
which is number 2216 in the little black book. Affirmation from Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. Sisters and brothers, as you go out into this beautiful day, may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless you, guide you, keep you, and challenge you. Not just you, but all of us, and us as a community of faith. That those who near, need to hear the good news might hear it through the words and actions of the likes of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. Thank you.